Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dr. Neil Malhotra about the biggest issues facing social innovation and responsible capitalism over the next decade. Neil Malhotra, welcome welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, John. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us. Actually, today you're in San Diego, but you're joining us typically from the Bay Area. You're a professor uh, in the Stanford Graduate School, and it's a pleasure to have you. Today, we're going to be talking about the biggest issues facing social innovation and responsible capitalism over the next decade, and really how that can and should inform our leadership within organizations. As we get started, I wanted to share Neil's bio with everybody. Neil Malhotra is the Edith M. Cornell Professor of Political Economy in the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. He also holds a courtesy appointment in the Department of Political Science. He serves as the Director of the Center for Social Innovation at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and he received his MA and PhD in Political Science from Stanford University. He received a BA in economics from Yale University, and he's the author of Leading with Values and editor of Frontiers in Social Innovation. He has authored over 80 articles on numerous topics, including American politics, political behavior, and survey methodology. And I just scratched the surface. There's so much more that uh, we could talk about by way of your background, but I'm going to hand it over to you. Anything else you would like to highlight for me or my listeners before we dive on into the conversation? Um, so just a little bit about kind of the, as director of social of the Center for Social Innovation, you know, we run a lot of programs like uh, social entrepreneurship program and impact funds and impact investing. And we oftentimes get so many emails, you know, can you help our organization? Um, how, what can you know, we learn from you? And one reason we release this book is because we don't have the scale to reach everyone, but we don't want our ideas cloistered in the ivory tower. We want to share them with everyone so they can achieve their dreams of making the world a better place via organizations. Um, so that's just kind of what motivated me to work on these, these issues. And stuff. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I agree, you know, I, I see myself as, a, or at least I certainly strive to be a scholar practitioner. Uh, I'm not at Stanford. I'm at a regional teaching university, Utah Valley University in Utah, a little bit south of Salt Lake City. Um, but, you know, everything I do, I try to make sure that it's scholarly as well as practitioner influenced and that I can disseminate it more broadly, hopefully to have the impact that we're we're shooting for, right? Because nobody wants to write an article that only gets read, you know, by colleagues in their discipline. They want to to do things that are going to make a difference in the world. And that's the kind of work that you're doing. And I applaud you for it. So let's start the conversation today by talking about the biggest changes in social innovation and nonprofit management over the past decade or so. And then we can get into some of the biggest issues we're facing moving into the future. Great. Well, I think your question kind of reveals some of the changes. So definitely two decades ago, the main vehicles of impacting society through organizations was the nonprofit form and also government. So people who were interested in influencing society for the better tended to go into those fields. And, you know, I think a big Uh, advance in nonprofit management at the time was to make nonprofits run more as regular businesses, have revenue models, don't just rely on foundation funding, etc. The big changes over the last few decades have been that there's a diversity of organizational forms that can yield social innovation. 
So you have for-profit corporations, hybrid corporations like benefit corps and B corps. Um, you have different funding models, so not just philanthropic funding, but you have impact investing funds, and not just niche impact investing funds, but ones started by major financial institutions like JP Morgan, uh, Texas Pacific Group, et cetera. So it's become just much more mainstream where social innovation has been embedded within the mechanisms of capitalism rather than being separate and apart from that. that makes sense. Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, so I'm in heavily involved at my university of about 42,000 students uh, in the social impact space. So I'm the academic director of our Center for Social Impact and uh, social innovation being a piece of that. We actually adopted the Stanford Pathways model uh, a few years back uh, in terms of the pathways of, of social impact, which includes uh, corporate social responsibility, social innovation, uh, in addition to some other uh, approaches to trying to drive social and community change. Uh, and it's it's just wonderful to see the evolution of all of this over time and how more organizations are trying to lean into this space. They're not, it, it, I, I think more and more, it's not seen as a separate, you know, if you want to be a do-gooder, go start a nonprofit, go do that. Um, but it's, it's, it's really many organizations have their own philanthropic arms within the corporation. Uh, as you mentioned, there, it's just a lot more embedded. And I think that's healthy for everybody. Um, there's also, you know, lots of critiques around capitalism as an economic system, uh, the, the ability for capitalism to address the, the most challenging social problems of our day, environmental problems and such. Um, and so as we move into this, what you what you framed as responsible capitalism, some people talk about stakeholder capitalism, triple bottom line, uh, various terms to talk about. The, the, the general idea that we just need to have more responsible capitalism. Let's unpack that a little bit and talk more about what that can look like moving forward and how we can, I mean, that's the system we have. So whatever the critiques are that people may have of, of the capitalistic system, you know, that's a great conversation to have, but it is the system we're working within. And so how do we leverage that system and even uh, revise that system, even uh, uh, change it in such a way that it can better address the types of needs that we have? that are pressing today? Yes, that's a great question. And just a little bit of historical context for your listeners, you know, kind of the, the growth of shareholder capitalism is, it was not an immoral thing. It was a moral thing in the 70s and 80s. So there was a lot of concerns that the economy was doing poorly, there was low productivity, and a lot of this was blamed on managers not being good stewards of their shareholders' money. The kind of ideas from people like Milton Friedman and Jack Welch were actually based on moral kind of bases. And let's be honest, the growth of capitalism has lifted millions of people out of poverty throughout the world. But just like anything, anything can go too far. And kind of the overemphasis on short-term shareholder profits has really kind of made capitalism not work for many people and cause a lot of externalities. So I think there's a lot of lip service around stakeholder capitalism. And the problem is, is that nobody actually wants to write down what it so if you look at the Larry Fink memo, um, the Business Roundtable memo, it's just a lot of fluff, to be honest, um, because they don't actually explain the trade-offs. So there's, if you actually, you know, shareholder capitalism for all its faults is extremely logical. It basically says, if you work for these shareholders, you have one job, which is to maximize the share price for the company. And whatever you do, that's what you need. Now, the problem is, is that the stakeholder capitalism people don't have an equivalent logical statement. like that. They're afraid to write it down because it's a lot tougher. So if you actually care about society at large, well, how do you balance the needs of different stakeholders? Something that might be good for consumers could be bad for employees. Something that could be good for the environment could be bad for labor or racial equity. So this is the problem with, with current stakeholder capitalism is that people want it to be very fluffy and not rigorous. And I think the, the, the movement has to be to actually manage the trade-offs. And if you want to manage the trade-offs, you have to write these things into the financial statements in a real manner. So right now, for example, when you look at like how companies report their carbon capture or their you know, diversity or whatever it may be, 
um, or their living wage, they get to pick the metric. But that's not true for like um, revenue. It's not like you can just like make up revenue. There's gap standards on that. Now, obviously firms like fudge all that stuff, but there at least is a written down set of standards. So if you need to, if you want to move to stakeholder capitalism, you need to have the tools, machinery that shareholder capitalism has, which is a set of accounting and reporting. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And I like, on the one hand, I really like that organizations are now being pushed towards um, reporting on these sorts of things, but you're right. It, it's completely all over the place. Uh, <laughs> so it's hard to have apples to apples comparisons and everyone, every organization really just gets to decide how they're going to report it. Uh, and so that makes it really challenging. Uh, and so then it's the question of, is it just spin? Uh, is this just really PR uh, or are they actually doing anything that's making a real impact? Uh, or are they really addressing these types of issues? say it's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, great. What does that mean? What does that look like within organizations? What are the metrics that need to be reported? And you're right, that hasn't been fully fleshed out, certainly not to the point where people are agreeing on it and everyone's doing the same thing. So people are reporting on all sorts of different things. On the one hand, again, it's good that people are now thinking about it more, reporting on it. We need to go to the next step and get people to actually have consistency in the reporting approach. You talked about gap you know, for, for revenue and financials. Um, what what might that look like uh, for stakeholder capitalism if we were going to go down that path further? I mean, yes, there's like engineers and accountants working together on these issues. So, for example, there's ideas that you would actually kind of count and uh, what your environmental impact is. So you would actually look at how much carbon you put into the atmosphere versus, uh, you know, um, taken out, how many trees were planted versus taken out how much pollution was put versus reduced, things like that. You could put dollar values on that. And then, you know, what's reported is, yeah, this was your profits, which helped your shareholders, but we're now going to subtract out what you hurt society um, along with it. Um, and then potentially, once you have that, that kind of reporting, that stuff can be taxed, right? Um, and then you can actually pay penalties and you have to internalize those externalities. Additionally, there may not be official government taxes, but there could be informal taxes. For example, once you report that stuff, like this was your um, dollar value of the environmental damage you did, maybe then pension funds and foundations can divest from you um, because they have the actual information, just like they would divest from you now if your revenue started falling. How you get everyone around the table to agree on what these standards are going to be, that's that's tough, right? And I'm not sure how that happens, um, but that's probably the next step. Is to, it to... is, but I would say that the shareholder capitalism had very similar uh, controversies, mm. and they were able yeah. to solve them. So, for example, you know, I mean, it, it seems like a minor issue, but how do you count an account receivable, right? Now, that's like a, a new minutia issue in accounting, but it's actually quite complicated. Yet, they like have a gap standard on like when an account's receivable goes into revenue versus not. Um, so I'm just saying is that just because something is hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And there's been, I think, equally hard challenges in the past that people were motivated to solve because of the benefits to society, um, because we need to have common accounting standards. And I hope we can do it again. Yeah, agreed. We, we shouldn't shy away from something just because it's challenging, just because they're difficult conversations, just because it may seem a little bit politically charged. Uh, they're, they're necessary conversations. And with the, the types, the scope and scale of the challenges facing the world right now, um, we need this uh, and we need this badly. Um, and I'm wondering now if we can transition a little bit as we're thinking about responsible capitalism, we're thinking about social impact, social innovation. Uh, what does all that mean now from a leadership perspective? Uh, if if I'm running a team, uh, say middle management on up through executive level C-suite, why should this matter to me above and beyond the PR piece um, that, you know, most organizations recognize they need to do something. Otherwise, they're going to look like a horrible corporate citizen and, and then they're going to th their customers are going to flee and it's, it's going to be a challenge. But beyond that, getting to the point where this is something that actually matters to us. Why does it matter? Why it doesn't need to be a focus? And what can I do as a leader? to better embed uh, mm. successful impact metrics and, and approaches within my organization, you know, and maybe lead out on this before there's any standards that are established. 
Yeah, so I'll answer that from kind of like a moral perspective and then a strategic perspective. So, you know, from a moral perspective, capitalism relies on these institutions being very strong, like democracy, et cetera. And if all of these social problems kind of threaten those institutions, whether it be climate change or inequality, et cetera, then there's not really a good environment to do business. So, you know, I think Americans and Europeans, people kind of in the industrialized world, you know, they, they have a lot of privilege and they don't oftentimes see that a lot of things they take for granted, like the rule of law, property rights, et cetera, like don't exist in every country, low corruption. And, you know, that can, that's not, that's fairly fragile. So that can go away if these social problems create um, social instability. Now, I think on a strategic perspective, it's, it's actually unclear for a lot of companies if their customers really care. I mean, especially like, you know, maybe B2B companies or, you know, think companies are just not in the public eye. But I would say that there's so many stakeholders that can give you help. Um, and that includes, you know, regulators, employees that walk out, things like that. And I would say that the whole stakeholder capitalism model is so much more democratized than it was 30 years ago, or let's say in the 1950s. So, I mean, what Ralph Nader did to put pressure on the product companies, I mean, that's something very, very hard to do that he did. He had to like kind of build a social movement. You have to convince like elites like the New York Times that you're serious, things like that. Well, now you can just have viral tweets and you can put a company on its heels. So companies have to be just a lot more careful than they were in the past because the ability for mobilization socially is just a lot easier than it was decades ago. The ability to rapidly share uh, and put pressure uh, it is in, in many ways an asset. It's, it's, a, it's a great tool uh, to be able to use. It also increases the complexity around all of this. And perhaps it makes it a challenge for organizations to want to get around the table to, to have these hard conversations. Um, and I don't know the history like you do, but going back to uh, shareholder capitalism and the emergence of this, uh, this predates, of course, uh, widespread use of the internet and social media and any of those sorts of things clearly there's still political challenges associated with it but my it, it just feels like it probably would have been a little bit easier in that context to navigate this than in the world of of viral tweets and social media uh as everything can can just uh launch into uh these 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 viral public campaigns and moments that could easily derail conversations, it seems like. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword for sure. I agree with that. I think it's, it's complex to know if it's net positive or not. But I would say that like companies care a lot more of these issues now because the reputational risks are much higher. That you don't need to go to an elite first. That's your gatekeeper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So everyone is definitely paying more attention. And again, that's that's one of the greatest shifts that I've noticed over the last couple of decades is, you know, when we talked about social innovation or corporate social responsibility, you know, 20 years ago, triple bottom line, even and, and some of these types of things, they were they were fringy. Uh, you know, some people were focusing on them, but they weren't the mainstream. And now this is becoming more and more mainstream. It's just kind of the the general expectation. And certainly for for millennials and for Gen Z workers, they don't want to work for an organization that isn't, you know, more responsible or uh, taking, you know, what they deem to be uh, good, healthy stands on social issues and those sorts of aspects. Yeah, I think one reason for that is that capitalism has become a lot harder for those generations. You know, if you look at kind of the restriction of housing supply, um, increased cost of education, it's not like you could just like work for one of these Fortune 500 companies and have this ticket to an upper middle class lifestyle. Like that just era is over. So I think a lot of this younger generation, they have to be motivated by something more than this hedonism because it's not there for them anymore. So that's why I think you have a lot of this generation saying, okay, well, if work is not going to get me an upper middle class life, I, it has to be consistent with my value. Otherwise, what's the yeah. point, you know? 
Very well said. Um, so I'm wondering now, as we're getting close to wrapping up, if there if there's any final thoughts as you're thinking into the you know five ten years plus into the future, where do you see things moving? What do you think the state of affairs will be, say, in a decade from now? Um, do you think we're going to be able to wrap our heads around and, and start making really good substantial movement towards uh, addressing things like climate change through our corporations, those sorts of things? Um, I think yes. And I think one reason for that is that I think we're getting more disciplined and just like kind of finance became more disciplined with kind of thinking through what makes you know the value of a company, gathering more data, we're going to be doing the same thing on the social space. So you can't just kind of have nice glossy brochures anymore. I think it's going to be that you have to kind of show that you're making impact. You have to have a theory of change, strategies for measuring impact. And, you know, our book, Frontiers in Innovation and Social Innovation, goes over all of these models and frameworks. And increasingly, like, if you want to be in this sector, you kind of need to be conversant in these models and frameworks as it's getting more disciplined. You can't just show up with a glossy brochure. All the impact investors demanded. And I think that's a good thing. I think kind of being more careful and rigorous is what, like, leads to success. So that's yeah. why I'm optimistic about the future. Yeah, good. And I share that optimism uh, with a healthy skepticism. I mean, it's like it, we have we ha we ha it's hard. And so we know it's hard and hard things, you know, to move the needle. Um, you just have to continually put effort and pressure into it. Um, but I, I do feel that overall, um, I, I remain optimistic and it's worth the effort. It's worth the time and the energy. It's, it's worth putting the pressure uh, on our organizational leaders, on our politicians to, to make positive movements. And ultimately, I do think it will bear fruit. I, I just hope we can get there fast enough. Um, but uh, but I, I sure hope we do. Well, Neil, this has been a real pleasure. I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in a few minutes. But before we wrap up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at N-A Malhotra, N-A-M-A-L-H-O-T-R-A. -A -A. You can also look up the social, Center for Social Innovation um, on Google, uh, Center for Social Innovation at Stanford. You can Google that, and we have all of these free teaching assets and videos that you can take advantage of, um, as well as learn more about the book. Um, and, you know, I guess my message to your listeners would be uh, to, to keep working, that social innovation is hard. It um, doesn't have the immediate rewards of product market fit, uh, unicorn growth, all of that stuff. But you know, in the long term, kind of slowly and sustainably building society for the better, improving human welfare is worth it. It is absolutely worth it. Worth the time, the effort, the energy, for sure. Neil, it's been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Neil and his team can do for you. Check out his research, check out his books, all the great stuff going on at Stanford in uh, in his center and all the things he's involved with. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.